Hi class, welcome back to Electromagnetic. So today I want to introduce a new concept to you uh, that's uh, relative to transmission lines and that, that is the Smith chart. The Smith chart, a uh, very valuable tool and it can definitely help in understanding what's going on in transmission lines. It's probably used much more uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, somewhere in there. Um, I don't know that it's used so much today, at least not ex extensively what it was back then. I st still think it's valuable for you to know <clears throat> and to understand what's going on with it. So the thought for today, a uh, gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger, Proverbs 15, 1. So I think this is good advice to all of us, uh, especially this day and age. Um, and I think we really need to open up the channels of communication, and to do that, we need to work on and practice the gentle answer. Uh, I think too many times, or too many things I'm seeing, it's, it's harsh words, and so that's just stirring up all this anger, and it's not accomplishing anything. Um, I think wisdom dictates to us, especially as Christians, that we should work on the gentle answer to hopefully turn away this wrath and open up these lines of communications. And so. Uh, it's a little bit of a stretch. This thought that was a, an applicable thought because of the transmission lines, you know, that are used for communication paths as well. So uh, just thinking about communication today, and, and, and this, this first came to mind. Okay, so this, uh, this will wrap up part A, the frequency domain part of our look at transmission lines and transmission line analysis. So uh, actually this module on canvas you'll see only has one lecture where we usually have two but that's because i'm dedicating this whole time to smith chart so this is a lecture that you're probably going to need to go back and watch maybe two or three times because smith charts the first time around can seem a little complicated and a little tricky but if you work through it a couple of times you'll start to see you know how things work and then it really becomes pretty neat actually how it works and, and how how, uh, how how you apply it. So I would encourage you to, you know, to, to maybe just sit back and watch this first time through and the second time through, uh, you know, watch it again, second time through, maybe try to stop it and work through things as I'm going along. So let's see how this works. So to start out, uh, we're going to look at the same model we've looked at before, and that is a uh, transmission line that has a discontinuity. And, and so by discontinuity, I mean that at some point Z equals zero, uh, we have a change in the physical characteristics of our transmission line. And uh, you know, more specifically, that either our permittivity or our permeability, permeability or both have changed as we transition uh, across the Z equals zero point. And so uh, as we've looked at before, you know, this can be you know, that you have two plates or wires or whatever you want to have here, and there's some type of dielectric in between them, and so we've changed dielectrics. Uh, or the same thing with like some type of concentric circles with coaxial cables. Sometimes that's how it works. You have a conductor in here and then a conducting sheath out here. And then, you know, maybe you have uh, some plastic uh, uh, cladding in here. Um, so whatever it is. Uh, you know, this is this is the scenario we're looking at for this for this for this lecture. So with this in mind, we can now look at and define some impedances, and you know, start to wrap our, our minds around what that means. So in general, we can just take the Ohm's law approach, uh, simply that impedance at any point z is equal to the vo voltage at that point z divided by the current at the same corresponding point z. So this is the simplest definition of that. So if we look at line two, like we had before, that was the part on the right-hand side after the discontinuity, and we're assuming that it goes on infinitely or uh, as far as very far, then that's just simple. Our impedance at any point Z is equal to this voltage uh, divided by this current. So we'll call this Z02, which is just a constant. So over here, this is a function of Z. Over here, this is a constant Z02. And for all z on this line two, therefore, we're saying this is constant because there's no reflective wave. The discontinuity is behind us, right, as we're traveling from left to right. It's not true for line one. So line one's a little more uh, complicated. 
So in this case, we'll say that the impedance in line one for any given Z, again, is that voltage at Z over the current at Z. But in this case, it's not going to be constant all the, way, all the way down the line. And so what it's going to be is we're going to have this, what we'll call it initial impedance, which is the impedance right at the discontinuity. And it's going to be one plus the reflection coefficient at Z over one minus the reflection coefficient at Z. So in this case, we know that our reflection coefficient of Z is some initial value times this phase uh, function here, e to the j beta Z. And so here we define this initial reflection coefficient as just the difference in our two impedances at the discontinuity over the sum of those two. So this is a pretty important starting point right here is our initial reflective coefficient. So the Smith chart, which I'll show you in just a second, this is just a mapping of all the potential values, but these are normalized. They're going to be normalized line impedance uh, on, the reflection coefficient, on the reflection coefficient plane. So we're going to have to walk through this. So let's start out by talking about the normalized line impedance. And so this is going to be defined as uh, some normalized value of Z sub Z. That's what the N means. So that's going to be our original z as a function of z divided by the z naught or this initial impedance. Well, if we were to look back on the past, the previous sheet, z of z was just the z naught times this value, so that divides out that z naught. So we can rewrite this then by doing just some alge algebraic manipulation, and we can say, okay, well then our reflection coefficient as a function of z is now this normalized value minus 1 over the normalized value plus 1. But extending this a little further, we know that our impedance is a, should be a complex value, right? So it should have a real part, which is just our resistive part. And then it'll have this imaginary part, Jx, which is either capacitive or inductance, you know, whether this is plus or minus. So we have a real and reactive part to our impedance. So if we plug that in, we can now say that this reflection coefficient if we just take the magnitude of that, it's going to be the magnitude of now R minus R plus JX minus 1 over R plus JX plus 1. So all I did was plug this R plus JX into this equation. It gets us here and taking the magnitude. Well, we know we can take the magnitude by taking the square uh, root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So in this case, R and minus 1 is real. The Jx parts uh, imaginary, and the same thing here, R plus 1 is real, the Jx is imaginary. So we come up with this new value, R minus 1 squared plus x squared square root over R plus 1 squared plus x squared square root. We should be able to tell pretty readily here that um, this value should always be uh, less than 1, except for the case when R is 0. In that case, it will be equal to 1. And so we see now that's why we have this uh, statement up to the right here that this is always less than or equal to 1 because of how this is constructed. So the next thing we want to do is we want to look at mapping these values or graphing them. So we're going to graph two different things. We're going to graph the normalized Z plane in the Z plane. So and we're going to graph in the uh, reflection coefficient plane. So let's look at what that looks like. So on the left, you can see we're doing the normalized Z plane. So this line going up and down, since uh, the x-axis is our resistive, this is a constant resistance of 1, right? And so if we have a constant reactance of plus 1, that would be this line here, the B line. So the A line is resistive, the B line is reactive. Well, what we want to look at is a little different. It's what Mr. Smith looked at. He said, instead of graphing that, why don't we to make the x-axis the real part of our reflection coefficient? And we'll make the y-axis the imaginary part of our reflection coefficient. So now if you graph that, this r equals 1, instead of being a straight line, now becomes this constant circle right here. So this circle is for resistance equal to 1. Okay, and then if we plot this half, reactive half plus one half, it makes a circle as well.
but the circle goes outside of here. So remember we said that the maximum value of the magnitude of this reflection coefficient is one or less. And so that's what this circle here is that constant reflected coefficient equal to one. And so, uh, you know, every all solutions must lie with inside this circle. So that's why we only see just this part of this larger circle that goes all the way around. Um, <clears throat> If it were negative one half, then this line would be flipped about the x-axis, so it would actually go right here. And so, that's just the initial thoughts or way to think about this. We're going to expand on this, but again, this a line here is now this a prime circle, and this b is a b prime circle. If you ever take a course in complex variables, they'll they'll cover uh, a section on mapping, conformal mapping fascinating material but it can be a little complicated but this is one thing they do is they map from one domain into another and that's really kind of what we've done same type of thing happens when you go from the time domain to the fourier domain that's a mapping as well so it, it presents the information in a little different way but uh, in a way that can be pretty useful so we're, let's look see how we use this so if we were to extend this out we'll see that this is what common Smith chart looks like. And so you'll see we have these uh, growing circles. They all start from this furthest right point. And these are all constant resistance values. And so uh, if you were to look at this, and I'll put one that you can look at, you know, blow up uh, on the Canvas site. But you can see these values along here. So this is like 0.3. So everywhere on this circle here, the real value is 0.3. Everywhere on this circle here, you can see it's 1.0. So this is the unity circle. So this is 1. Uh, over here is 3, so everything on this circle, the real part is 3, so on and so forth. And again, with the positive reactances, uh, same thing. We just mapped a bunch of them over here for all the different possible values. Same things for negative reactances, just mapping those all out here. So what you really have is everything starting from here, and they're not centered here, they're tangential to here. And so you have circles growing uh, in the upward direction, you have circles growing to the left and you have circles growing down and so that's what this really is is real circles uh, plus imaginary circles negative imaginary circles so let's look at how we can use this <clears throat> before we go on i thought it'd be appropriate to take a quick stop since i'm only doing one lecture do a historical background uh, and hopefully you can figure this one out. Uh, if, you, if not, then you probably haven't been paying attention of who this person might be. So education-wise, this individual went to Tufts College. Uh, he worked for Bell Laboratories, which was instrumental throughout the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s even. There were just some landmark uh, discoveries and inventions uh, during that time. Uh, here's a picture of this gentleman, modern day. And in case you hadn't figured it out, this is Mr. Smith, Philip Hagar Smith from 1905 to 1987. Of course, some of the notable things, he invented the Smith chart, the very thing we're studying. Uh, one thing that's interesting is he submitted a research paper based on this method uh, to the Institute of Radio Engineers, uh, and it was rejected. They immediately rejected it, and looking back historically, it's because they didn't understand it. Uh, but it's okay, they kept looking at it, and as time went by, he, the paper was uh, eventually accepted because they were able to figure out what he had done and that it did actually work, and so he was elected to be a fellow of this organization later, so he persevered through that. Uh, one interesting note is this is the only picture of him that's in existence, uh, at least that I can find on the web. And I, there's even some places that stated that this was the only picture you're going to find of him on the web. So I'm not sure what that's all about, but I don't know if that was an interesting fact. So let's get back to our transmission lines and let's look at how this works. Okay, so this, this is where things get a little bit tricky. So you're going to have to pay attention. Like I said, you may have to look at it a few times. So Here's our original discontinuity right here, right? At z equals zero. And we're gonna come on a transmission line and arbitrarily put a load here. Uh, it's gonna be reactive only, so it has an imaginary portion, and we're locating it at z equal negative L. All right, so for this scenario, we're gonna say that our z01, so that's the impedance just to the left uh, of this uh, 
a transition is 150 ohms and then to the right our impedance is going to be 50 ohms and then we're going to say that uh, our load that we are inserting here is negative 0 0.003 uh, Siemens okay so it's a reactive load and we're going to say that we're locating it at 0.375 lambda 1 so we don't care what the frequency is uh, what we'll find out on the Smith charge because it's normalized um, we only care what it is in relation to the wavelength because remember if you go back a couple of lectures we saw that as we look at these transmission and reflective coefficients they were cyclic right for every uh, half wavelength they start to repeat and so we just need to know uh, what, where we are in reference to uh, uh, a fraction of the wavelength itself as we know that this repeats <clears throat> so lambda 1 then is the wavelength of this source uh, frequency on line 1 so since line 2 appears to be infinitely long the load for line 1 is simply 50 ohms so that's just all the way across we don't have to worry about that one so let's talk about what's happening with the line impedance just to the right of this load here um, JB so again I've just rewritten our factors here and look at this uh, we need first need to determine the line impedance just to the right of JB For, to do this we have to calculate the normalized load impedance uh, for line one and so to do this and again this is at z equals zero you can see z1 equals zero it's going to be the ratio of our two lines here so line two on top is 50 ohms uh, line one on bottom is 150 ohms so that gives us a normalized impedance of one-third so that's the normalized impedance of what's happening across this transition so now that we have that let's see if we can go find this point on the smith chart so here's our smith chart uh, you can see i've got some predefined points and we're going to work our way through that but we want to find where we are um, for our normalized impedance so our normalized impedance has no uh, reactive component to it so we wouldn't expect to find it in the lower upper half plane we'd expect to find it on this line here because it's uh, resistive only there's no no j component and so when we do that we look and see it's it was one third so we would start at point a and so this is z1 uh, at the location zero so here's where we are on our smith chart again normalized impedance So now that we've figured that out, we now want to figure out what our reflection coefficient is at the junction. Well, this is the definition. If we go back and look of the reflection coefficient at z equals zero. So what that means is, if we look back at our Smith chart, this is also our reflection coefficient at zero. So that one point's the same thing. Now remember, this is the actual reflection coefficient. This is the normalized impedance. So this is not the impedance, but normalized impedance. You gotta keep remembering that. Okay, so now we want to find the reflection coefficient at the point of the load, which is located at 0.375 lambda one. So we know what the reflection coefficient is uh, here as we travel back up this line towards the source and remember we're going towards the generator is what the smith chart calls it so we can go toward the load or toward the generator uh, we want to find out what our reflection coefficient is uh, at the point of the load all right so let's see where that is on the smith chart uh, again we can find this value on the smith chart by moving from our original point on the constant magnitude circle uh, to a distance from from z equals zero to z equal minus l so let's look at how we do that and again we're going towards the generator sorry very important so here we are back in uh, with our smith chart and this is where we are located at our discontinuity so we draw this we notice this circle here and this circle is centered on the smith chart so this is at that point 1.0 so once we have this circle here to find that's centered on the Smith chart, this circle has a constant magnitude for reflection coefficient. So that means as we move around here, we're gonna have different X and Y values. 
But if we take the square root of both of those, add them together and take the square root, our magnitude's always gonna be the same, right? So uh, our real value and our reactive value will change constantly, but if we keep taking that magnitude, it'll be constant reflective coefficient magnitude there. So we note over here that this moving clockwise around this circle, any circle in here is, is representative of moving towards the generator. And so that means we'll move on this circle here, the constant reflection coefficient uh, around the circle there. And so we can see, uh, if you look at a Smith chart, the one I'll, I'll put on the website, you'll notice that there's tick marks all the way around and they're in terms of lambdas. And so we, here's, this is zero lambda or you know, at, the discount, at the discontinuity point. We run here, this is 0.125 lambda away from this point. This is 0.25 away from this point. This is 0.375 lambda. We keep moving around, this will be half lambda because remember we said it's cyclic. So every half lambda, we're back where we started as far as the reflection coefficients and impedances and all of that. So in this case, if we move around this circle, uh, this constant reflector coefficient circle until we get to this point here, 0.375, we arrive at this new point B. So as we look at B, we see there's these two dashed lines that intersect there. We have this first circle, and if we recall from a few slides back, this is the constant real circle. And so we just have to find where this circle uh, intersects this line here. Uh, the horizontal line, and when we do, we see that it's 0 0.6. So everywhere on this circle, the real part is 0 0.6. We also notice this piece of this larger circle. Remember, it goes on outside the, the Smith chart boundary. But uh, this also intersects, and these are constant imaginary uh, circle lines. And so to read that, we have to go over here to the edge and see where it intersects over here. And when we do, we see that it's at negative 0.8. So we've got a real part, 0.6, imaginary point of negative 0.8. So this means at this point, our impedance at L, where L is 0.375 lambda, we have a real part of 0.6. We have imaginary point of negative J.08. So that's our normalized impedance. If we want to get our full impedance, we have to multiply it times what our original line impedance was, was 150. So let's look at how we do that. So here that is, so we take our 0.6 minus J.8 times our Z01, but remember our Z01 is 150 ohms. So when we do that, the impedance then uh, at this point right here is 90 minus J120 ohms. So next we wanna start thinking about standing wave ratio on line one, just to the right. Remember standing wave ratio is gonna give us an indication of how much reflection we have on our line reflection's bad. So we want to, we need to be aware of what's going on there. Well, we can do this directly from the Smith chart by starting with our normalized point at z equal negative l and following the constant magnitude circle until we get to the point where the phase angle or the imaginary point is zero. So this corresponds to the place uh, where we cross the horizontal axis. So let's look at that on the Smith chart. So since we're talking about standing wave ratio, we need to recall that standing wave ratio can never be less than one. So since it can never be less than one, all the points on the left of this point here, which is 1.0, are less than one, and all the rest of them are greater than one. So that being the case, our standing wave ratio is only in this range. So even though we cross the horizontal line twice, the only one that gets valid for our standing wave ratio is the one on the right-hand side. So if we follow our circle here and see where it uh, intersects that horizontal, we see that it, ha it hits right here and we read off there and that's three. So this means then that our standing wave ratio at the load um, is going to be three. So that means we do have some reflected wave there. We do have some reflectance. So we can also readily determine the admittance on the line just to the right of the load using the Smith chart. Um, and so because of the land over two nature of the load, we can always interchange between impedance and admittance on the Smith chart by just going halfway around um, 
the constant reflectance coefficient circle and reading that correspondent point. So let's look at how we do that. So here we had our impedance at this point B uh, is this 0.6 minus 0.8 J times 150. Let's say we want to know what the emittance was. And of course, we can use a calculator and figure that out. But one cool characteristic of the Smith chart is we can just move to the mirrored side on the other side and read that point. So this point D here, uh, if we were, again, we're on this constant circle here, uh, which gives us the point 6, and we're on this constant imaginary, which gives us that uh, 0.8 value. And so when we read that off, our admittance then is going to be 0.6 plus J8, and then instead of multiplying by 150, we divide by 150. So if we look at that over here, uh, you know, just writing this back out again, it's 0.6 plus J.8 divided by our line impedance. Uh, so we plug the values in, and what we'll get is 0 0.004 minus J.0053 Siemens for our uh, admittance at that point. So now we want to see if we can determine what the standing wave ratio is now, the new standing wave ratio, um, taking into account the load that we have on the line. And so uh, to do this, we notice that our new admittance is our original admittance plus this uh, new load. And so since it is a an all imaginary load, we should expect that it will just um, adjust the uh, reactive part, not the resistive part. And so we can normalize that. We know what the normalized, uh, previous normalized admittance was. And so we can take this load, divide it by the line in admittance, not impedance, and uh, then go back to our Smith chart. So that being the case, the real parts will stay the same <coughs> of the normalized impedances, the new and the previous. It's just the reactive part that's going to change. And so the Smith chart, this is pretty easy to figure out. Let's take a look. Um, when we do that, it's going to shift our uh, admittance part uh, on the Smith chart by this negative 0.45. So we got our 0 0.003 is what our imaginary part was uh, previously. That's the not normalized part. We normalized that. And so let's see what this looks like on the Smith chart. So before we were at point D, remember, and that uh, that corresponds with let me get my laser pointer here. It corresponds with this half circle here, so it's 0.8, right? And so this was our original point, 0.6 plus J 0.8, and remember that would put us on uh, this real part of the circle. So remember, for this circle, the real this is a constant real value, so because we didn't change the real value of our admittance, we have to stay on this circle, right? So again, constant real circle. And this is our imaginary circle that we're on now, this 0.8. So now we're going to have to shift it. And so when we do, we'll go from our 0.8 value, we'll go back, we're moving uh, uh, backwards because it was negative 0.45, right? So when we do that, 0.8 minus 0.45 gives us 0.35. So you'll look on that scale on the, if you have one of the, the Smith chart I showed you earlier, and I'll put a copy of that on, on the canvas, you'll see that you can go from 0.8 to 0.35. Of course, this corresponds with this new portion of a circle. It's, of course, it's a much larger circle that goes off the page, but we, can, we have to stay within this uh, maximum uh, reflectance value. Uh, coefficient value of one and sorry this curve doesn't fit exactly on the dashed line as close as I could get it to go so anyway <clears throat> so now because we have to stay on this constant real circle we find there are the new intersection point is and so this new intersection point is at this point E and so now this corresponds to 0.6 plus J <clears throat> 0.035 so we'll recall from before that if we take a circle and center it on the Smith chart, that's a constant standing wave or reflective coefficient uh, circle. That'll be the constant all the way around there. Uh, and we remember 
too that that's uh, where we can get our standing wave ratio and it's always on the right side right half of that where it intersects remember this is the range here for our standing wave ratio so if we follow our circle around until we hit that axis we'll see that the new standing wave ratio it hits right at 1.94 so our new standing ratio is 0.194 so in a sense, this has actually improved the condition on our line. We added this load on our line and it reduced our standing wave ratio from three to 1.94. Remember the goal is to get to the center, which is when our standing wave ratio is one, which means we have no reflected wave on our, on our line. So that brings us to another idea. Uh, as we've already noted, the ideal situation on a transmission line is to have a visor of one. And so again, that corresponds to where that dot is on the Smith chart, that center of our Smith chart. So when we have this condition, it means there is no standing wave on the transmission line. So uh, you'll hear this term referred to then is that the line is matched. If we have a perfectly matched line and we have no reflection, and that's when we're gonna get um, our maximum power flow uh, on the line. So there'll be no interference. So on the Smith chart, uh, this situation again is represented by the point in the middle of the chart. So how do we get there? Well, to accomplish this condition um, as seen as, as at the source, we can use the previous procedure that we just saw uh, in reverse by strategically placing certain values uh, of react reactive load at strategic locations to effectively tune the transmission line. So we do this basically by adding a load that will shift the impedance to that dot. Uh, before we can do this, though, we must first identify the location for the load that places us on the uh, unit conductance circle um, as shown below. So remember, this is where we have constant uh, resistive. Remember, these circles are constant resistive or are, are real, the real part. And these other lines are imaginary parts. So we want to first uh, locate our load on this line. And then remember, we can uh, shift that load down until we get to, this, to the point at the, uh, in the middle. So once we find this location, how to get us on that circle, again, we then simply read what the normalized reactive load needs to be to swing us around this circle wherever we are on it until we get to the center. And again, once we get to the center, we're at the location where the standing wave ratio is equal to one. So we can actually shift it two different ways. So once I arrive on this circle uh, at any point, uh, I can add a load that would take me, you know, counterclockwise around or same way, I can add a load that'll take me clockwise around. That's, that results in whether I'm adding, adding a negative or a positive admittance, uh, imaginary admittance. So if we return to our previous example and we remove the load, that JB load that we had before, we can now start at point C, uh, which is the admittance uh, at the load and move towards the constant visoire circle until we intersect the unit circle. Remember, this is the unit circle here. So we're starting with C and we're trying to get on this circle here. So again, starting at C, uh, and so this is what our standing wave ratio is now, right? It's not one. Uh, we've got to get to the center to get to one. This is our unit conductance circle. So we want to get on this circle first and then we'll swing around on it. Um, so, in our example, uh, we want to get to this location of H. So, we've got to move the load or find the location on our line until we uh, hit that point H. And so, in this case, uh, we've got to do it at point 167 lambda. So, we've got to find the space on our physical space on our line away from our load uh, to the point to where uh, we're 0.167 lambda away from the load. We could also uh, move in the other direction uh, to G, and at this place we're 0.33 lambda away from the load. But this is this can sometimes be a little tricky because sometimes it's beyond where our load is, and there may not be a physical place to put that. 
So in this case, we would move counterclockwise to get to from C to H. Uh, again, trying to get to that 0.167 lambda location. And for the other one, we would move clockwise 0.33 lambda uh, to get to the G location on the unit circle. Remember, we're trying to find the point on this circle here. So this is two, again, two possible locations. Possible location of the first load is 0.16 lambda away from our load. The other one is 0.33 lambda away from our load. So once we find that location, um, you know, what do we need to do? Well, remember, we're wanting to slide around uh, this circle until we get to the center. Well, the way we did it before was, remember, if we put different loads on, we start picking different imaginary circles. Uh, constant imaginary circle. So we want to finally get to the point to where we're uh, down to basically the horizontal line. And so you can see if I put a load of 1.16 uh, 1 um, at this location, that's going to make me slide around. See this line, it'll become more tangent with that line, slide around until I hit the center. Same thing on the bottom. Uh, we get uh, negative 1.16, the normalized reactance for the second load. And so this second number that we read on the outside of the circle, this will tell us we're going to use a stub as a load, and that tells us what the stub length needs to be to get that um, normalized reactance, and it needs to be 0.136 lambda long. Same thing down here. Uh, if we were to select this location, we would need a stub length that is 0.364 lambda long. And remember, this is all because this is repetitive. Every half lambda cycle, is, we repeat. So that's, that's how we accomplish this. So using that information, uh, we can use these values on the Smith chart. And we can calculate for both these loads. If we do for point G, remember the location of the matching load um, we said that we're going to go uh, negative 0.33 plus 0.25 times lambda 1. That gives us a negative 0.083 lambda 1. And then the value of the load that we need to put there, uh, the normalized value is 1.16. So we can multiply that or times 1 over 150, our, our line admittance. And that gives us the value, the actual value. And then that corresponds to a stub length. Um, we add those two values again off the Smith chart. That gives us 0.36 lambda 1. Uh, using these values from the Smith chart for point H, the second location, um, this time we're going clockwise, so we go 0.250 lambda around the outside of that circle, 0.167 more lambda around to get us to 0.417 lambda. Uh, and so that means we're moving away to the right on the load. This means we're moving to the left, away toward the generator. <clears throat> and so the value of that impedance then, uh, the normalized, we said, was negative 1.16. So if we multiply that times the line admittance, which we said was 1 over 150, that gives us the actual uh, reactive value there. And so we can correspond that to a physical length of our stub which will be 0.364 minus 0.250 gives us 0.114 lambda. So that's the length. That's a much shorter, shorter stub. So we have a little bit longer stubs, probably, gosh, I guess it's almost three times longer there. So this is what we call tuning our line with a single stub tuner. So what does that look like? This is what it looks like. So if we have whatever our transmission medium is here, um, we have this is line one and this is line two. Well, if this line two has different characteristics, such as different permittivity and or different permeability, we're going to have a discontinuity there and it's going to cause reflection. Well, if we use the Smith chart and use that method like we just did, we can say, hey, we can come back, cut off a piece of this transmission line. It could be coax. I've seen it done with coax cable. You can put a T at this location. You can also do it with waveguide, uh, which we might look at later. Uh, it's diff you know, it doesn't really matter. What you do, though, is you find a way to insert this in. You come back that 0.083 lambda. So again, it doesn't really matter what the absolute frequency is. 
um, you know, if we do know the once we know the absolute frequency, we can calculate what the wavelength is. So we come back 0.083 from this discontinuity where we change, and we can cut off a piece of our transmission line, a coax or whatever, and make sure it's 0.386 lambda long, and just insert it there. And when we do, guess what? We've just tuned our transmission line to where there's no reflection. So, um, you know, this could happen. Happened actually quite a bit back when they used coax, and they were first starting to put in cable TV. And if you had like a 50 ohm line and you were plugging it into a, a, a TV set that had a 75 ohm receiver, you can sometimes read on there where you plug it in, it'll have a little ohm uh, reading underneath it. And many times they'd plug that in and this picture was horrible. It's because they were getting a lot of reflection on the line. So if the technician knew what he was doing, he could come back from the uh, termination uh, where you're going to plug it in, figure out what the... Uh, stub length needs to be using a smith chart he cut off a piece of coax put a t in there put this in there plug it back in the tv guess what it's all cleared up because you've just matched the lines and gotten rid of the reflectance so kind of a handy trick there again you're probably going to need to work back through this lecture a couple of times uh, this is very new but uh, once you get the hang of the smith chart it's, it really becomes rather easy and it kind of gives you a good visual of what's going on and again, this is all due to the nature, the cyclic nature of uh, the characteristics of transmission line. Remember, just the repeat, the repeat of that reactance part because of that tangent uh, uh, expression um, in the impedance. So uh, again, go back and watch this probably another time, and I think that'll, that'll help you out.